What's good, everybody? Welcome back to JFlow History, and today we're going to be talking about the court cases from the 14th Amendment. Let's get started. The court cases you'll need to know are Brown v. Board of Education, Gideon v. Wainwright, Roe v. Wade, and McDonald v. Chicago. Underneath McDonald v. Chicago is District of Columbia v. Heller, which you must know for McDonald v. Chicago to make any sense. Just like the First Amendment video, before we begin with court cases, we need to talk about the amendment itself. So let's get started with the 14th Amendment, specifically Section 1. Section 1 of the 14th Amendment states, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. That's a mouthful, but there's two specific clauses that make this amendment special. First is this clause highlighted in blue. This is the due process clause. I'll expand more on that one later, but first I want to talk about the one highlighted in red, and this is the Equal Protection Clause, which grants that all citizens are granted equal protection under the law. Now that we got that out of the way, we can start with our first Supreme Court case, Brown v. Board of Education. This case will be using the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Some quick context to this case is the court case Plessy v. Ferguson. To sum it up quickly, trains during the late 1800s were segregated by skin color with the better trains usually reserved for white people. This was taken to the court where they ruled separate but equal, pretty much stating that segregation was okay since both sides were getting equal treatment and luxuries. This leads to the Jim Crow laws we learned about in US history where just about everything was segregated by racial lines in the South. The segregation happened in schools, and it was very prominent in the South because that's where they practiced de jure segregation, which is segregation that is forced on upon law. Under this de jure segregation, colored people were not allowed to attend white schools. Well, this becomes a major problem, and in the states of Kansas, South Carolina, Virginia, Delaware, and Washington, D.C., all had cases that the Supreme Court wanted to view. So the Supreme Court decides they'll hear it all under one case, Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka. This case is going to be vital in shaping the 1900s race issues, so that when the case came, the Supreme Court realized that they had to be unified on this decision. This case was going to set a precedent for the future of rulings dealing with race. So while it's in the Supreme Court, the Brown family argues that the Equal Protection Clause makes segregation illegal. Topeka in return argues with the precedent set by Plessy v. Ferguson that separate but equal is okay. So what did the court rule? They ruled 9-0 to zero with Brown, stating that separate is inherently unequal. This overturns the precedent set by Plessy v. Ferguson, and that is going to be extremely important in ending segregation. This is a big win and moment for the civil rights movement. On to our next case, we have Gideon v. Wainwright, which will be involving the Due Process Clause. So here's the rundown. This man right here, Clarence Earl Gideon, gets arrested as a suspect for a robbery case. When Gideon goes to court, he asks for a lawyer, but the court says no because lawyers are only given for capital offenses. Well, when you don't have a lawyer, it's kind of hard to defend yourself in court, so Gideon gets found guilty and is sent to jail. While in jail, Gideon decides that he's going to learn some law, just to make sure that state courts had the legality to not appoint him a lawyer. Well, lo and behold, what Florida did went against the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution. So Gideon sends a petition to the Supreme Court so they can hear him out. And the court says, yeah. So Gideon gets a court case to challenge what Florida did, and this time, he has a lawyer. In that case, the Supreme Court ruled 9-0 to zero with Gideon, where they selectively incorporated the, the Sixth Amendment into the states. Now, I bet you're probably wondering, what does selectively incorporated mean? Didn't Florida just violate the Sixth Amendment, so shouldn't that be it? Well, yes, but also no. Let's first understand what selective incorporation means. Selective incorporation is a power at the Supreme Court that comes from the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. And to understand what selective incorporation means, we need to look at how the Bill of Rights applies to the USA. As you all know, the Bill of Rights applies to the federal level, meaning that the federal government cannot violate them. However, as for states, the Bill of Rights actually did not apply to them because of the ruling of Barron v. Baltimore. To make them apply to states, the Supreme Court has a process known as selective incorporation where they can pick and choose which parts of the Bill of Rights should later apply to state governments. Action like that is known as judicial activism, the practice in the judiciary of protecting or expanding individual rights through decisions that depart from established precedent 
who are independent of or in opposition to supposed constitutional or legislative intent. Or in normal English, when the court makes rulings that change the interpretation or application of laws. Think of the opposite of judicial restraint, where the court just sticks to the Constitution. Up next is the court case of Roe v. Wade, which will also be using the Due Process Clause. So here's the story. This woman here, Norma McCorvey, who used the legal pseudonym Jane Roe to protect her identity, wanted to have an abortion. However, abortions were illegal under Texas law unless they threatened the life of the mother. A new and upcoming lawyer, Sarah Weddington, decided to team up with Norma to combat this Texas law. So they filed a lawsuit against the Dallas District Attorney, Henry Wade. This makes its way up to the Supreme Court and the court rules 7-2 with Jane Roe stating that there is a right to privacy implied by the 14th Amendment that makes abortion legal. However, the decision over abortion was split by trimesters where the first it is completely the mother's choice, the second states can restrict but not outlaw it, and finally the third where states have the freedom to ban it if they choose to. This case has been a hotly debated topic with people who want to keep abortion legal taking the side of pro-choice and people who want to ban it take the side of pro-life. The final case dealing with the 14th Amendment that College Board needs you to know is McDonald v. Chicago, which will also be using the Due Process Clause. But before we talk about that one, we need to talk about District of Columbia v. Heller. So, the District of Columbia had a law that banned firearms. However, there were some exceptions, like if you were a police officer, you could file a license to keep one at your home. One such police officer, Dick Anthony Heller, made an application and sent it to the District of Columbia, but they rejected his application. So he decided to file a lawsuit against the law. The lawsuit made its way to the Supreme Court where they would hear Heller's complaints. Heller argued that the District of Columbia's law went against the Second Amendment of the Constitution. The District of Columbia, on the other hand, argued that the Second Amendment did not guarantee you the right to own a gun. Keep in mind, this case was in 2008. Well, the court ended up ruling 5-4, to four, stating that people are granted the right to own a gun with the Second Amendment to an extent, meaning we can't just casually go out and buy missiles at our local Walmart, but we are allowed to purchase some types of guns. Now, before we move on to McDonald v. Chicago, I want to clarify the controversy that surrounded the Second Amendment at this time. So as we know, the Second Amendment states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So where did the controversy happen? Well, it revolved around the word militia. Did it mean only military, or did it mean the regular everyday people also apply? Well, as we know from the ruling, the court said the right to bear arms is not exclusive to the military. Now that we know this case, it will make McDonald v. Chicago much easier to understand. So as you all know, the District of Columbia is not a state. That means the Bill of Rights and Second Amendment does apply to them. But what about other states? Do they have to follow the Second Amendment? Well, it's going to have to be selectively incorporated with the Due Process Clause, and that's what McDonald v. Chicago will do. In Chicago, they had a law that outlawed firearms. So a resident of their McDonald, please don't get it confused with the fast food chain, took it to court. This was only two years after the Heller case, and most of the Supreme Court justices were the same. So unsurprisingly, they again ruled 5-4 to four where the Supreme Court has selectively incorporated the Second Amendment to apply to states. In conclusion, we learned about four cases, Brown v. Board of Education, which overturned separate but equal. Next was Gideon v. Wainwright, which selectively incorporated people's right to an attorney granted by the Sixth Amendment. Roe v. Wade, which used an implied right to privacy from the 14th Amendment that made abortion legal. The first trimester is the mother's choice, the second it can be restricted but not banned, and finally the third trimester the state has control. Finally, we learned about McDonald v. Chicago, which selectively incorporated the right to bear arms from the Second Amendment, which was established by the District of Columbia v. Heller. That's all I have for you all in today's video. Make sure you subscribe and like the video so I can continue making more content like this. And finally, remember to chase your dreams, stick to your passion, and peace out.